In the near future in the city of Moscow, Oleg and Aliona are having a date, during which Oleg explains he's a soldier on a two-week break. The date goes great, and the two of them end up spending the night together. Meanwhile in Paris, a plane is about to land when suddenly all its lights go out and everyone aboard loses consciousness. Soon this loss of power spreads around the world, only leaving a small section of Eastern Europe with light. Oleg and Alion notice that the drones that fly around Moscow freeze mid-air, and they rush to the hotel lobby to see what's going on. Every person in the building is gathering there to listen to the news. The anchorman explains that this wasn't a consequence of any natural disaster, and while at first they suspected it to be a terrorist attack, they've discovered they've lost contact with the rest of the world. A group of soldiers led by Mayor Dolmatov is sent on a recon mission to Karov, one of the many cities that are now in darkness. Journalist Olga goes with them to record any clues they may find. The government has sent drones into this area already, but none of them has made it back. The team wanders around the city and enters a store where they use special slime lights to have a better look. This is how they discover every citizen in here is dead, even the fish in the bowl. They can't help wondering how everyone died since there aren't any indications of an attack. It's as if happened instantly out of nowhere. Then they begin to investigate different apartments, where they find everything in its place as if nothing happened. Once again, it looks like it happened instantly as if people vanished into thin air. Suddenly, one of the soldiers is attacked by a mysterious being. The rest of the team rushes to help him, but as soon as the being sees them, he takes the soldier's weapon and escapes through the window. The team immediately opens fire, but the being doesn't seem affected by bullets and runs away. They take the wounded soldier to their plane and ask him if he saw the face of his attacker, but it was dark and the struggle made it impossible to notice anything. A month later, more than 100 million Russians are considered dead, and the government tries to ask the remaining population to stay calm. However, religious groups are gathering because they think the end of the world is coming. Meanwhile, Yura is one of the many civilians that receives a letter asking him to join the army. Yura lives with his mother who suffers from Alzheimer and it pains him to leave her behind, but he joins the army anyway. When he leaves for the base, he notices the current state of the world, since just one month was enough for the streets to look post-apocalyptic. Yura ends up joining Oleg's team, which is informed of the current situation by Dolmatov and Colonel Marina. Every city in darkness is considered under quarantine, and the only existing power can be found in Moscow, parts of Belarus, Ukraine, and Finland. This area is known as the Circle of Life. Some Retkin teams have come back with bodies, and they've discovered they died from endogenous neurotoxins, which are chemicals produced by the human body. The new teams have two tasks, find clues for the scientists to understand the cause behind these neurotoxins, and to go deeper into the quarantine zone to gather resources because Moscow is running low. They need to be careful because they've already sent many teams and most of them didn't come back, even if they had tanks to protect them. While everyone gets ready, more volunteers arrive, and Oleg is surprised to see Aliona among them. Suddenly, an alarm goes off alerting of an incoming attack. Apparently, there's a group of huge enemies coming closer, thus the soldiers gather at the border between the base and the quarantine zone. At that moment, the power at the base goes out, so Dolmatov begins shooting flares for a more clear view, and when the strange beings are close enough, the soldiers open fire. Some of these beings manage to reach the base anyway and begin attacking everyone in sight, causing Oleg to lose consciousness. The next morning, Oleg wakes up under the weight of a dead enemy. Yura notices he's still alive and asks for help moving the body. Now Oleg can see the strange being was actually a huge bear. In fact, there are dozens of bear bodies on the other side of the border, and nobody understands why they behave like that. Olga is there too recording everything for the news. Oleg is taken to the infirmary and is surprised to learn Aliona's a doctor. She takes care of his injuries, and when he feels pain, she comforts him with a kiss. Meanwhile, Marina and Dolmatov discuss the matters of censors, a group of people that supposedly gained powers after the blackout. Marina explains they aren't like superheroes, censors can actually receive data in their minds like radios receive signals. However, they haven't been able to decipher the data or how this happened. The strongest sensor is Sasha, who is being kept in a military hospital. Since the blackout, he keeps having nightmares about a mysterious bald guy. Today he's being visited by Xenia, who says he was sent by someone named Id. 
He explains the first wave destroyed all electronics, the second launched the self-destruction of all biological organisms, and the third wave will make anyone still alive in the quarantine zone attack them. There are millions of them, and their free will is gone, but they have time to stop it. Sasha doesn't want anything to do with this and calls for security, but the soldiers can't see Xenia and tell the doctor that Sasha is hallucinating. The rest of the soldiers get ready for the mission. Yura ends up traveling with Olga, who makes him some questions for the camera. Yura admits he doesn't mind the current situation because it's given his life meaning, and it's better than being a taxi driver. When they make it to the quarantine zone, they discover the tanks destroyed on the ground and a chasm cutting through the buildings, implying the third wave has already begun. The footage of this destruction puts the remaining population in a state of panic, causing riots and an increased crime rate to take over the city. The government promises they're working on it, but people think their leaders are hiding something. The soldiers are divided into groups to cover more ground. Yura and Olga are in Group 7 and as they cross the woods, a flirting tension grows between them. When a recovered Oleg arrives, he joins Team 4, who investigates a small town. One of the soldiers opens a storage room, causing a bunch of metal bars to fall on top of him and hurt his leg. The team decides to rest inside a house until a doctor comes. The next morning, Alion arrives and announces the soldier will have to return to Moscow with her if he doesn't want to lose his leg. Group 7 also spent the night inside an apartment, and while they're having breakfast, Yura notices something weird about a store. He checks Olga's recording and confirms the doors weren't opened when they arrived. Yura and a few soldiers enter the store and find evidence someone was there, so they decide to set up some traps. Then they return to the apartment and wait for the traps to activate. This doesn't happen until night falls. Everyone gets ready to leave, but Yura asks Olga to stay inside and teaches her to use the flares to ask for help if they don't come back. Olga ends up disobeying Yura and follows the team anyway to record everything. Inside the store, they find a teenager that was wounded by the traps. They take him into the apartment and try to help him, but the boy reacts by stealing a knife and killing a soldier. The others immediately react by shooting him down. Meanwhile, Sasha goes to have some fresh air on the hospital roof and is suddenly startled by Ide, the guy Zhenya told him about. Zhenya had only been a mental connection, but Ide is actually here and wants Sasha to help. To convince him he knows what's going on he shows his face and reveals he isn't human. At that moment Marina shows up with a bunch of soldiers pointing their weapons at Ide, but suddenly they all turn their weapons on Marina. Ide explains he used his mental powers to make the soldiers see her as Ide and he as Marina, so she shouldn't try anything. He also swears he's on Marina's side and warns her that millions like him are coming to end humanity. When Marina asks what he is, Ide says humans would consider him a god. Marina takes Ide to her office to interrogate him. Ide explains he was supposed to start an irradiation process when the moon was above the oceans, but he made a mistake. The moon was covering this section of Europe, so it protected it from radiation. That's how the circle of life happened and everyone in the quarantine zone is only a mindless drone that will attack soon. Ide's race needs Earth because their own start is about to die and they want somewhere new with a sun to live in. Then he reveals there was a wave zero thousands of years ago. This wave was the human race, which is actually a bio weapon sent by the aliens to destroy the native population of planet Earth. It was the previous native people that built the pyramids in underwater cities because they had been much more developed. Humans are the perfect bioweapon because they're destroyers and colonizers, and they share a lot of DNA with Ide's people, except they were stripped of any psychic abilities. The unplanned radiation is causing some people like Sasha to get them back. An army from Ide's planet is arriving tomorrow, but Ide's brother Ra is already here. Ide doesn't agree with his methods and wants to find him, but the only one that knows the location is Sasha thanks to his dreams. In the meantime, all the teams are suddenly attacked by mind-controlled humans. The soldiers immediately open fire and try their best to establish a line of defense, but the enemy comes in huge numbers and doesn't have trouble fighting back, killing most of the teams and causing them to run out of ammo. When the apartment they're hiding in blows up, Yura asks Olga to shoot the flare, but most teams are doing the same thing and there aren't enough resources to help them all. For now, the few remaining members of Group 7 will wait on the roof of a building to be out of the attacker's reach. Marina's conversation with Ide is interrupted by a message informing her of the attack, and Ide points out they're wasting time. 
The two of them together with Zhenya and Sasha fly to the base, and during the trip Ide explains he's immortal as long as nobody decides to kill him. When they make it to the base, Ide puts Sasha in a trance and he manages to draw Ra's location, which is a skyscraper in Kirov. Ide wants to mobilize the remaining tropes immediately, but when Dolmatov sees Ide's appearance, he doesn't know if trusting him. At that moment a soldier announces Moscow is being attacked as well and Marina convinces Domotov by pointing out Ide is their only hope. Back to Group 7, they decide to climb down the building to search for the teams that didn't send any flares. Olga is terrified to try, so Yura kisses her to calm her down and lowers her gently. As they walk through the streets, they find a few civilians and kill them before even talking to them. Olga is upset by this because they looked fine but Yura reminds her the teenage boy had seemed fine at first too. As if to prove his point, a new wave of drone humans attacks them. All the other soldiers die but Yura manages to fight the attackers off, getting wounded in the process. They run to hide inside a garage, where they take care of Yura's injury and find a car with gas and keys to use to escape. At the base, Sasha confesses he's scared to go because he's sure Ra saw him during the vision and Ide allows him to stay behind for the sake of his safety. When Dolmatov's team leaves in the tanks, Marina notices Sasha is missing and makes everyone stop. At that moment, a series of rockets attacks the base and blow it up. Marina points her gun at Ide, angry because he obviously knew about this, and Ide admits it's true. However, if Sasha had been with them, the team would have died instead, and they wouldn't have won the war. The next morning, Yura and Olga find Oleg and Alion, their team has few members left too, and they've run out of ammo. Fortunately moments later Dolmatov's team finds them and asks them to join the mission to kill Ra. Olga and Eliona will have to come along because there's no base to send them to. Hours later, the team arrives at Kirov. Dolmatov is surprised they aren't being attacked, and Ide explains Ra thinks he died at the base. The streets are blocked by the drone humans, and there are a few of them jumping from above with bombs. The army just pushes ahead with the tanks, shooting or crushing any enemy that tries to stop them. When they make it to the skyscraper, I takes Yura and a few soldiers with him to the rooftop while everyone else stays at the entrance for defense. The fight is absolutely vicious and they don't know for how long they'll be able to keep up, so Oleg takes the civilians upstairs too. After killing any enemies inside, I and the soldiers meet with Ra on the rooftop. Yura tries to attack him but Rai simply pushes him away and leaves him hanging on the edge. Ida attacks Ra next and their fight is pretty even, but when Yura climbs back up and a huge explosion can be heard on the streets, Ra gets distracted and Ida takes the chance to attack him directly, removing a device from inside Ra's body. Yura immediately cuts in and puts a grenade in the resulting hole, finally killing Ra. Now Ida can use his powers to release all the controlled humans. He announces the next step is to kill the aliens arriving in the spaceship, since humans were made to kill after all. Zhenya doesn't understand why I didn't warn them of all this before the blackout happened, and Aliona and Marina protest against the way Ide is using humans. When Ide says he's the god humans deserve, Zhenya attacks him with a knife, but Ide uses his powers to make him kill Marina instead. Furious, Ole tries to attack Ide too, but Yura comes in his defense, pointing out Ide is the only hope they have against the incoming invasion. A fight begins between Yura and Oleg, and when Olga notices Yura is beating Oleg up, she grabs a gun and shoots Yura to make him stop. Zhenya tries to kill Ide again, but Ide easily stops him. Oleg thinks about killing Yura and shoots at Ide instead, yet bullets don't do anything. Ide uses his powers to make Oleg see everyone as his father, causing him to hesitate. However, thanks to being a sensor, Zhenya can find the real Ide and he jumps to bring him down with him. They both die as soon as they touch the ground. At that moment, a giant spaceship lands on a bunch of buildings. Oleg grabs the device Ide took from Ra and leaves with the women after refusing to finish Yura off. After taking some weapons from fallen bodies, the trio enters the spaceship, which opened the door because it's waiting for Ra. Inside there are hundreds of aliens sleeping in pods, and when Oleg presses the device, oxygen starts being transported to those pods. It seems Ra was supposed to wake them up, and the timer on the pods confirms they'll be ready soon. They try shooting at them and confirm it does kill them, but they don't have enough ammo or time to do them all. Olga notices the pipes carrying the oxygen are on the floor, 
and destroying one kills many aliens at the same time. The trio begins destroying every pipe they can find, effectively stopping the invasion. However, when Aliona is about to destroy the last pipe, she freezes because she realizes these last pods have children in them. The kids begin leaving the pods and when Oleg sees them, he drops his weapon to the ground, not being able to hurt innocent creatures.